good morning. Uh, my presentation is on a process-based model that can be used to estimate ammonia and nitrous oxide emissions from open lot cattle facilities. My co-authors are Al Rots, April Latham, Heidi Waldrip, and Rick Todd. So everyone's here in the room. Uh, okay, so open lot facilities for beef and dairy operations are sources of several gaseous emissions. And these include ammonia and nitrous oxide. And to assess the environmental impacts of these uh, gases, and also to evaluate potential mitigating measures, uh, we need values or estimate for this uh, emission. So currently, there are several ways to directly measure this emission from open lots. But implementation of these uh, methods can be costly and, and difficult. So one alternative approach of estimating emissions, as we, we're doing uh, in this study, is through process-based model. The, 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 the process-based model that we use is the Inter Integrated Farm System Model, or IFSM. So IFSM is developed by USDA ARS, and it is a research and ed educational tool for evaluating the performance, environmental impacts, and economics of crop, dairy, and beef production systems. Uh, this is the whole cycle of uh, farm simulation in IFSM. So these different farm components are being simulated on a process level and our simulation is being done on a daily time step. And when we perform our simulation, we usually try to use multiple years of weather data to give us a better idea of the performance of the production system. So in our simulation, in the IFSM simulation, we start with the crop component. Uh, so here we model the, the growth and development of the crops uh, depending on the weather conditions, uh, soil type, and also the available nutrients in the soil. And then once the crop reaches uh, maturity, then the model will simulate harvesting. Uh, at this stage, the model will, will track the nutrients lost during harvesting and then the nutrients that remain in the crop. And also the model is capable of predicting uh, how many hours, how, many, how much labor, and then how, many, how much fuel are needed to perform the harvesting. And then the harvested crop will be moved to the feed storage in which the model will predict the, the losses in nutrients and then the changes in the nutrients of the feed. And then based on the resulting feed, uh, the model will predict the rations for each animal group that is being simulated. Uh, also for the animal component, the model is simulating the performance of the animals in terms of uh, feed consumption, uh, milk production for dairy cattle, and also manure excretion. And then for the manure excreted, uh, the, the model will predict the, the losses and then the changes in the nutrients while it stays in the housing and then while it's being handled and stored. And then the remaining manure will be applied to the field and here the model will predict how much nutrients is being returned to the soil. Uh, so this is the, the whole cycle of farms IFSM simulation. And as I've mentioned, this is being done on a daily time step. Uh, the previous version of IFSM, which is version 4.0, has been evaluated in predicting ammonia emissions uh, using measurement from uh, two Texas feed yards. Uh, the, the measurements were taken over a two-year period and in general, the IFSM did uh, well in predicting ammonia emissions for these two feed yards. As you can see for feed yard A, the, the annual trends of ammonia emissions based on the measurement and based on the simulation of IFSM were comparable. Uh, same can be said for feed yard E, uh, except we just have to uh, neglect the first set of measurement because they encountered some problems in their measurements. That is why the ammonia emissions measures were very low. Also, the index of agreement performed, uh, calculated during this evaluation range from 0.63 to 0.81. And this value suggests that there was a good agreement between the emissions measured and then the emissions simulated by IFSM. So in this version, uh, the the the, the parameter that significantly influenced the ammonia emission would be the temperature. So as you can see, the, the trend of uh, ammonia emission uh, just followed or have a similar trend as the temperature within the year. Uh, the next step that we did was to 
to verify the performance of IFSM in predicting ammonia emissions for open lot facilities located in western U.S. Uh, the measurements that we used were measured or were taken at an open lot dairy in southern Idaho and, and the measurements were based on limited numbers of days. Uh, based from this result, uh, comparing with, unlike with what we found with the simulation with Texas feed yards, the IFSM did not do well in predicting ammonia emission for this open lot dairy. If we're going to look at the graph, the, the trend of ammonia emissions, so that would be the red line, the trend of ammonia emissions simulated by IFSM basically followed the trend of temperature within the year. But if we're going to look at the emissions measured, uh, the trend that can be observed was different. And also, uh, the index of agreement computed was very low at 0 0.14. And this small value suggests that the FSM almost had no agreement with the emissions measured at this open lot dairy. So this finding suggests that uh, for this open lot dairy and possibly for open lot facilities uh, that had similar conditions, uh, there are parameters other than temperature that can influence the amount of ammonium that can be volatilized or can be lost as ammonia gas. Uh, the Texas and Idaho facilities differ in terms of climate conditions, uh, in terms of air temperature, solar radiation, and wind speed. Uh, these two locations have similar trends within the year. But if we're going to look at the precipitation, as you can see in the monthly bar graphs, um, the amount of uh, precipitation that is being received for each year differed between these two locations. So in, uh, looking at the seasonal values, okay, in 2008, Texas received around 352 millimeters of annual precipitation. And most of these were received during fall and summer seasons. But Idaho received a far less precipitation of 212 millimeters in 2008, which was low compared to what Texas received for that year. And most of this uh, was received during fall and winter season. And if we're going to focus on the summer uh, season, uh, Idaho received only 29 millimeters. Uh, and this was very low compared to what Texas received during that year, which was around 100, 181 millimeters. So, uh, this difference in climate conditions, uh, particularly the trend in precipitation, could have led to differences in uh, manure pack conditions, uh, such as moisture content. And this, uh, this, this difference could have affected their potential to emit uh, ammonia emissions within the year. Uh, so, this study had two specific objectives. The first one was to improve the performance of IFSM in predicting ammonia emissions under different climatic conditions. So in the new version, we are including the effects of both weather and manure pack conditions in the simulation of ammonia emissions. And the second objective was to incorporate a routine to simulate nitrous oxide emission. This is just a simple diagram. This is just a simple diagram to illustrate uh, how the previous version of IFSM version 4.0 uh, simulated both ammonia and nitrous oxide. So we have two sources of nitrogen. We have uh, nitrogen from the urine and then the feces. And then the urinary nitrogen hydrolyzes to become ammonium. And then we also have some ammonium coming from the feces. And then the ammonium undergoes dissociation to become ammonia in aqueous form. And then this ammonia can be lost in the form of ammonia gas uh, depending on several factors, uh, specifically temperature. And then we also have uh, wind speed and also concentration gradients. For the nitrous oxide emissions, uh, in the previous version, uh, we actually have formulation to simulate the process of denitrification. But in that version, uh, what we did was to, to refine some parameter settings based on the IPCC factor. Uh, which states that around 2% of the excreted N can be lost as uh, nitrous oxide. So applying this assumption, so what we did was just to implement a constant nitrate concentration in the manure pack. So basically in this version of IFSM version 4.0, uh, both the, the weather and then the manure pack condition 
uh, really had no influence in the prediction of nitrous oxide. In the revised version of IFSM, uh, version 4.1, uh, we included or we added more processes that can influence the ammonia and nitrous oxide being emitted, and all of the processes being simulated are better integrated. An example for for ammonia uh, emissions. So now we are simulating the effects of sur surface infiltration of the urine. So depending on the manure pack conditions, uh, specifically the moisture content, uh, some of the urine can infiltrate the surface and those that infiltrated won't be available for immediate volatilization. And also right now with this version, we are simulating ammonia coming from the fresh urine spots and non-fresh urine spots. For nitrous oxide emissions, uh, we are no longer implementing a constant nitrate in the manure pack. So now uh, we, are, uh, we, are, we are simulating the process of nitrification. So we start with the ammonium and then we simulate the nitrification to determine how much ammonium uh, converts to nitrate. And then the, the nitrate in the manure pack can undergo denitrification or if, if the manure pack is too wet or there's precipitation on that day, some of this nitrate can be lost through leaching. And those nitrate that, uh, that undergoes denitrification can be lost in the form of uh, nitrous oxide, di dinitrogen, and then nitrogen oxide. Okay, in the next two slides, I'm just going to show you, uh, we have tables showing the difference between the version 4.0 and then version 4.1, but I'm just going to focus on the settings or the formulations used for version 4.1. For the urea hydrolysis, now uh, we are now using an equation to determine the fraction of the urinary nitrogen that can hydrolyze within 24 hours. So our equation was derived using the data by MAC, using cat, uh, cell laboratory evaluation using cattle manure. And now our equation is as a function of soil temperature. For the surface infiltration, this was not being considered before, but now we are calculating the infiltration as a function of runoff curve number. And we are uh, simulating the runoff curve number on a daily basis as a function of uh, the manure pack moisture content. Uh, also, the effects of ammonium sorptions are being considered for ammonium located in uh, non-fresh urine spots. Uh, in modeling ammonia volatilizations, we are actually using same formulations for both versions. Uh, the difference comes in calculating some of the parameters needed, such as for the soil temperature, uh, we are now using a formulation adapted from the descent model. For the manure for the manure mass transfer resistance, we are now calculating it as an inverse of hydraulic conductivity of the manure pack. Uh, and as I've mentioned, we are simulating ammonia emissions from fresh urine spots and non-fresh urine spots. For the processes of denitrification, nitrification, and nitrate leaching, uh, we are simulating these three processes on a daily time step. And then the formulations that we are using were adapted from the descent model. For the organic matter mineralization, the formulations that we are using for both versions are similar. And in calculating the water feed pore space and in simulating the movement of moisture in the manure pack, in version 4.0, we are just considering the first five centimeter of the manure pack. In version 4.1, uh, we, we adapted the routine from the series maze model. So now we are simulating uh, the moisture movement within 115 centimeters of the manure pack and the underlying soil. And the manure pack is represented by around 15 centimeter depth. And then the rest will be the underlying soil. Okay, so after incorporating all these changes into the routine in, in IFSM, so what we did was to, uh, to repeat the previous evaluation just to make sure that the IFSM will still perform uh, well for these uh, Texas feed yards. So the simulation inputs were similar to the previous evaluation. For the animal number, we set it to around 12,000 for feed yard A and around 19,000 for feed yard E. For, for air temperature, wind speed, and precipitation, 
uh, the data that we used were measured on site. And then when we simulated these feed yards, uh, we adjusted the dietary crude protein to be equal to the feed sample measurements taken at the feed yards. For the Idaho open lot dairy, uh, we set the animal number to 10,000 milking cows. The air temperature, wind speed, and solar radiation were measured on site. But since they didn't install any rain gauge during the measurement, we obtained our precipita precipitation data from the nearby Agrimet weather station. And in simulating this dairy, uh, we adjusted some parameters so that the calculated dietary crude protein would be near the 17 to 18% range, which is typical for these dairies. Okay, for, for ammonia emissions for Texas Feed Yard A. So after making all the, these changes, as you could see in the bottom graph, the, the revised model is still able to produce the trend as measured at the feed yard, and the trend is also co comparable to the trend in, uh, produced by version 4.0. Uh, in year 2007, based on 152 days, the average ammonia emission was around 88 grams per annum grams of ammonia per animal per day, uh, the revised model was able to produce a closer average of 91 grams per animal per day with an index of agreement of 0 0.81 or there was 81% agreement between emissions measured and then the emissions simulated by the revised model. Uh, in year 2008, based on 215 days, uh, the average ammonia emission was 109 grams per animal per day. The, the model produced a slightly lower average of 97 grams per animal per day, but the index of agreement still remained high at 0.8. For ammonia emissions for Texas Feed Yard E, uh, again, as you can see uh, on the bottom graph, the trend produced was similar to the trend produced by version 4.0 and comparable to the trend as measured at Feed Yard E. Uh, in year 2007, based on 55 days, the average ammonia emissions measured was 85 grams per animal per day. The revised model was able to produce, again, a closer value of 83 grams per animal per day with an index of agreement of 0 0.62. Uh, in 2008, based on 194 days, the average ammonia emission was around 75. Uh, Although the revised model produced a, a, a lower value of 58 grams per animal per day, the agreement between the emissions measured and then the em emissions simulated was still reasonable at 59%. For the ammonia emissions for the Idaho open lot dairy, uh, this is where we observe the greatest improvement in ammonia emission prediction. Uh, after incorporating or after incorporating all the changes, the model is now able to produce the trend as observed as or as measured at the open lot dairy. And based on 13 days in year 2008, the average ammonia emission was 131. Uh, with version 4.0, it produced a higher average of around 185 grams per animal per day. But now the revised model was able to produce a closer value of 132. And then there was a big improvement in terms of the agreement between the emissions measured and then the emissions simulated. Before, the agreement was only 14%, but now it increased to 56%. For nitrous, nitrous oxide emission, uh, we only have data uh, coming from or taken from the Idaho open lot dairy. Uh, as you can see on the top graph, uh, so this is the trend produced by version 4.0. The nitrous oxide simulated was very low, and as you can see, it's almost constant. But with version 4.1, uh, the model is now able to produce uh, or to simulate the, the periods with uh, low nitrous oxide emissions, uh, as well as peri periods with uh, high nitrous oxide emissions. In year 2000, for year 2008, based on 13 days, the average nitrous oxide emission was 16.9 grams per animal per day, and the value produced by or produced by version 4.1 was around 13.5, which was very close to what was measured. And then the agreement between the emissions measured and then simulated was around 80%. Uh, 
We also calculated the ratios of simulated and measured emission rates just to give us uh, an idea how of the accuracy of the, the device model in predicting ammonia and nitrous oxide emissions. So based on the average values of these ratios for ammonia emissions, uh, for Texas Figured A, the ratio improved from 1.18 to 1.09. For Texas Figured E, initially it was 1.00 but now it lowered to 0 0.9 but if we're, if we're just considering the average value uh, this is still within the 10 percent of the measured emission uh, the biggest improvement was observed with idaho day before the ratio was very high at around 1.56 but now it lowered and has a, has a value closer to one uh, with a value of 1.07 uh, same thing can be said with the nitrous oxide emission the ratio before was very low at 0 0.5 but now the, the ratio increased to 1.05. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, the IFSM version 4.1 performed better in predicting ammonia emissions as influenced by climatic and manure pack conditions. For the Texas feed yards, uh, we, have, we now have a 59 to 81% agreement between the emissions measured and then the simulation. And this was, these values were comparable to the values obtained during the previous evaluation. For the Idaho Opelot Dairy, there was a big improvement in the agreement between the measurement and then the simulation. Before, the, value was on, the agreement was only 14%, but now it is 56%. For the Idaho Open Lot Dairy, the daily nitrous oxide prediction had 80% agreement with measured emissions. For future needs and improvement, uh, having a continuous measurement of uh, ammonia and nitrous oxide from open lots under different clim climate conditions uh, will be helpful as we can use them to confirm the accuracy of the model or we can con confirm the, the need for further refinement. And in future revisions, we are also actually considering making some of the parameter uh, input, uh, par some parameter settings to be user input, uh, such as pen manure removal frequency, stocking density, lot access time. Uh, okay, this is the end of my presentation. Uh, I want to acknowledge the United Dairymen of Idaho for uh, partially funding this project. Thank you. If you want to estimate emissions, you start with concentration first and then meteorological conditions, and then you input it to the dispersion model and to bulk calculate the, the emission rate. But for this one, uh, it is based on the processes that can occur in the manure pack to generate the, uh, that can generate or that can affect ammonia emissions. So there is a difference. But here, actually, we use a emission rate measured by wind track, so it's also a dispersion model in assessing the, uh, let's say, in assessing the performance of the model, but the approach is somehow different. So here, the emotion mission was based on how much, how much nitrogen is fed to the cattle, and then how much is secreted, and then what are the, mo what, what are the processes that can occur within the manure pack and how it affects the ammonia emission. Was I able to answer that? Yeah, I, yeah, is, is that clear? Is that clear? Does it do any modeling of hydrogen sulfide? Well, that's the other one I have to record in our assessment. Hydrogen sulfide? Uh, currently, we are 
how do we have a model for hydrogen sulfide from open ice? Any other questions? Yeah, um, good presentation, thank you. So, it seems that the model is keeping track mostly of climate, you know, temperature, moisture, and those conditions. Uh, you showed a table that um, you start with urea, hydrolysis, and then all the other kind of biophysical things, but the biggest controlling factor for ammonia is urea excreted by the animal. And um, so I'm just wondering why urea excreted by the animal is not, you know, kind of uh, one of the primary inputs into the model. Because if your ammonia emissions are more than the urea excreted by the animal, then, then that already tells you you have problems. Or if it's only 10% of the urea, you have problems. See what I mean? It, uh, so it's the urea coming out of the animal that's probably the most important factor. And then all the biophysical factors influence actual emissions. So my question is, why isn't urea excreted by the animal uh, an important variable in the model? So I wasn't just able to highlight the, that the ammonia emission is greatly dependent on the urea and nitrogen that can be excreted. But what I just emphasize here is we are evaluating the, how the model performs in simulating the processes. So we are just using the same amount of nitrogen or urea nitrogen for in version 4.0 and version 4.1. And actually in the model, it, it, it is capable of evaluating the environmental impacts based on how much nitrogen is being fed to the cattle or to the cow. So if you adjusted it, the model, let's say if you lower the amount of nitrogen being fed, the model will produce a smaller uh, or lower amounts of urine nitrogen, so that will lower the amount of ammonia emission that will be simulated. So I just, I just wasn't able to highlight uh, the importance of the, the amount of urea nitrogen on the ammonia emissions. But, but what you said is true. <laughs>